What is up, guys, and welcome to Q&A, the show where I take your questions from all over the internet and answer them here on YouTube in video format. Um, and we have a decent amount of questions considering that it's the off season. So let's just jump into it. All right, and the first question comes from Mike Keeley. He says, would it be a mistake for Stefanski to take a play to take play calling capabilities in his first year as head coach, similarly to Freddie Kitchens, or should he hire a dedicated offensive coordinator who oversees and manages? My personal hope is that that is the case for what the Browns plan to do with Kevin Stefanski. I don't think Kevin Stefanski is such a extraordinary offensive mind or thought of as an extraordinary offensive mind that you would want him to handle those responsibilities. Um, you know, the, if this was Josh McDaniels, I think the conversation would be much different. But Kevin Stefanski seems to be hired because of what they think of him as a person and less than what they think of him as a coordinator. So I would hope that Stefanski has a strong offensive coordinator and a strong defensive coordinator that can take those responsibilities from him. I think the one thing that we learned from Freddie Kitchens is, one, you need head coaching experience in your coaching staff if you're not going to have it with your head coach. And two, how important it is for a young head coach to be set up properly and not be overwhelmed because overwhelmed was the key word and every single report that was negative towards Freddie Kitchens it was the fact that he was overwhelmed um, with the amount of responsibilities he had to take on and he was just calling plays he had an offensive coordinator um, so you know for um, Kevin Stefanski I would hope that he sees the failings of last year in tries to use that as some kind of pseudo experience for himself in order to set him up in a good position. And I don't think that he will try to be the offensive coordinator or call plays on this offense. It doesn't seem like that's something that he is set on, um, which is a positive sign. But thanks for the question, Mike. Next question comes from Stuart Anderson, who says, how do you feel about the additions to the coaching staff? Um, these are the rumored additions. Um, uh, forgive me, I forgot their names already um, because they're not officially members of the Browns. But um, essentially, um, they're both assistants from the 49ers. The defensive coordinator is rumored to be um, Joe Webb. Uh, man, I'm sorry if I got that wrong. But um, it's him, and then I forget the guy on offense who's going to be the offensive coordinator. Um, so it, it's very simple. The Browns are following kind of a um, – a West Coast kind of um, Kyle and Mike Shanahan, Gary Kubiak style, which makes sense when you look at Gary Kubiak um, and his influence over Kevin Stefanski's offense last year. Um, it really does make a ton of sense that they're going in that direction with the zone blocking and everything. I mean, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I think Baker Mayfield is a great fit in that kind of offense. I think Jarvis and Odell are perfect fits, especially um, – Jarvis is ability to be a physical route runner and be physical after the catch. And then Odell, um, we know how amazing he can be when he's healthy um, and he's able to do damage after the catch. The type of receivers that the Browns have um, are pretty good for those situations. If you think back to the last time we had a um, Shanahan Kubiak offense that was in uh, what? 2014 with Brian Hoyer um, and the wide receivers were of course you had Josh Gordon but other than that you had shorter guys um, Andrew Hawkins Taylor Gabriel made his name on that team um, so those kind of receivers do fit well um, with that system um, so that would be something that's very encouraging um, now defensively um, it's going to be a bigger question you know, because ultimately you have Miles Garrett there, and I think as long as you have Miles Garrett, you should run a 4-3 because everybody else on the offense, I mean, defense doesn't matter. Um, and also, you know, the thing I'm worried about is what's going to happen to the secondary because, you know, I, I think there's some mismatch parts there that need to be realigned. Um, but thanks for the question. Um, 
And at the end of the day, Stuart, I think I feel good about what they're assembling from a philosophical standpoint. I wish that the people they were hiring were more experienced. Um, but from a philosophical standpoint, you know, I, I'm, I'm absolutely feeling what they're doing. The next question comes from Brian, who says, what is the Browns' biggest, biggest problem area talent-wise that people aren't talking about? Hmm. Some see a lot of attention is going to offensive line, safety, um, some are even talking about middle linebacker. I think it's going to be the corners. And when we have Greedy Williams and Denzel Ward, that sounds insane. Um, but I would say that Greedy and Denzel didn't seem to fit a zone scheme that well um, relative to what we know their talent is and less Greedy and more Denzel. Um, and with what they're looking like they're going to hire for the defensive coordinator position um, that doesn't look like the zone scheme's going anywhere. So that brings me to a question of, like, is Denzel Ward going to be worth it at his current value with the Browns um, if we're going to run a zone? Would he be more worth it to a team that's going to be running a man, you know, corner scheme? And would that value be so much that the Browns can get a significant haul for Denzel Ward? Um, because the fact is, is that this team's going to run zone. Denzel's a much, much, he's a decent zone corner. He's a much, he's a shutdown man corner. That's what he does best. Um, you got Greedy Williams there, who's an, I think, an excellent uh, zone corner. And I think the one shakeup that's going to happen and, you know, this is just a kind of a wild shot prediction is that um, Greedy will not Greedy, but Denzel Ward somehow ends up traded from the Cleveland Browns because he doesn't fit the scheme as much. You know, he's a he's a 85, you know, overall guy on the Browns as a zone corner. I think he's really like a 95 overall guy as a man corner. Um, that's just the difference in fits. And I think you might be able to get like a first or second round pick for that. Um, and, you know, given the Browns are going to go with a more analytical scheme, it might make a lot of sense um, for the front office to do something like that. So the biggest problem area, you know, we're going to talk about safeties, but I don't think safeties are as important as corners. And I think corners are good. I think the cornerback room, the DB room itself is going to be under a huge renovation this offseason. And I don't think a lot of people are seeing that coming. Next question comes from Sam Potter, who says, are the Browns going to be coming out with new uniforms for the 2020 season? Yes. And when you can expect to see them is um, April 4th. That's when they have announced the last two. So around that April 4th, I don't know, because April 4th is Saturday this year. So maybe April 3rd, or April 2nd. Um, but the Jets and Titans, the Titans in 2018, the Jets in 2019, both announced their new uniforms on April 4th. That seems to be when the NFL wants to get that kind of news out there. So the Browns and some other teams, there's normally two or three teams, um, will announce their new uniforms probably on April 4th this year. So buckle in for a few months before the draft comes. You'll see the Browns' new uniform. So that's going to be awesome. Um, the next question comes from Asian Raisin, who says, how do you feel about Kevin retaining three people from our 2019 coordinating staff? Um, I had to look at the people they retained. They retained um, Mike Prefer, one of his assistants, and then Stump Mitchell. I'm all for keeping Stump Mitchell. I'm all for keeping Mike Prefer. Um, I think those are good things to do. Um, those are the only valuable, well, not only, but those are the the few experienced coordinators and, um, and assistants on staff for the Browns last year. Those are the few bright spots. So, Yes, keep it, especially the running back room. Whatever they're doing to Nick Chubb, keep that dude. Um, so I'm all all for them keeping the people that they have kept. The next question comes from Lerpa, who says, "What are your thoughts on the twenty um, on the NFL draft in Vegas being in the Villaggio Fountains? Where do you have it located in 2022 when it's in Cleveland?" Um, first of all, I mean, like if you can see the render on the picture, um, it looks cool. Like that's gonna look really cool and i imagine um, the draft in vegas is gonna be a fun time um it's a good year that johnny like a johnny manzel type figures not getting drafted this year because oh my goodness johnny was in vegas after he got drafted and he got drafted in new york so he flew to vegas the day after he got drafted on his way to cleveland 
and we should have saw a red flag there in hindsight. Um, but yeah, this this draft being located in Vegas seems like it's going to be fun. Bellagio Fountains looks really cool. I don't know if you ever seen it in person. Um, it's kind of underwhelming depending on which um, angle you see it at, and it's really loud if you get a hotel across the street um, from it. But you know, it's pretty cool. Everybody likes to take a picture in front of it, and I think it'll be um, a cool setting. Um, and I'll where where should they have it in Cleveland? Where can they have it that would be really interesting for Cleveland? Um, you know, I hope they don't do it somewhere boring like the convention center um, or like on a street in downtown that looks just like any other thing. I really hope they find a way to incorporate the lake um, and use like Lake Erie um, and kind of have that in the background. That would be pretty cool. Maybe have to draft on a boat. I don't know. Um, you know, maybe use some of the west side. Well, not the west side, west side, but maybe use some of the flats area um, for that. I think that'd be interesting. A lot of that space is unused now. It's a lot of parking lots. So, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what they do. But I, I imagine they're going to do something cool uh, to make Cleveland look really cool. Um, and then I imagine everybody on ESPN is going to be complaining about having to go to Cleveland and make all these jokes, whatever. Um, the next question comes from Giants Nation. who says, what's up, Quincy? Your boy Eli just retired. Oh, I'm so, I'm so sad. And I know you're upset. I feel you, bro. But my question is, are you interested in the XFL? And who would you like to see go to it? Tim Tebow, Manziel, or Kaepernick? Um, look, I am a football nerd. So I am just excited to see any football. I really don't need a high-value name. Like, Cardale Jones is good enough for me. And those are the guys I'm interested in seeing in the XFL. A guy like Manziel, I'm, I'm done with the whole Manziel thing. Um, and then a the guy like Tim Tebow, I'm even more done with that. And then with, like, Kaepernick, I think he's too good of a prospect and a player to just play in the XFL. So I think it would throw off competitive balance, to be honest. Um but, you know, sure, it would be fun and get viewers. But for me, I, I just want to see good football. And I'm enough of a college football junkie and an and a NFL fan. And I, I scorched all these preseason rosters that I know some of the guys on there and know enough about them that I'm excited to see how they play. Um, so, you know, I think the guys that they have now, the lack of star power, I think that's fine. I think what the XFL is trying to do is try to make stars within the XFL system. Sure, I don't think they're trying to be the feeder system that the AAF was trying to be. I think they're trying to be a completely different alternative to that um, for the players and viewers. I think they're trying to make Cardell Jones into a big XFL star um, and have him be kind of the face of the XFL, not somebody you would necessarily think will get a lot of playing time in the NFL, but he's a big attraction in the XFL um, and build those guys up that way which i think is smart i think there is room for a second football league because i am always interested in this and um you know when you look at the af their failures were more that they didn't have money their own money they had money from people who invested in them with their own intentions but you know as far as themselves uh charlie ebersaw he never had the money um vince mcmahon who's running the xfl he has the money um, so I think this has a shot at being kind of a success or kind of like a fun little thing. Um, if you're looking for what they need to do on TV to be successful, they probably need to, you know, one, one or two million viewers every week. They can get on like ESPN or on a good cable network. They can get one to two million viewers for football in the spring. I think this will be something that will last a really long time. Um, but the next question comes from Beautiful Stone, who says, not sure if you've answered this already, but what are some of your thoughts on the new XFL rules and some that are better and worse compared to the NFL rules? Um, I haven't really dug in on the XFL rules. I think they have some interesting um, um, out-of-bounds scenarios when it comes to kickoffs. Um, I saw some of that on Marquette King's vlog. Um, I think also, you know, a lot of the rules are kind of just adjusting from what the AAF did, um, which I am interested in. I think the onside kick replacement for like the fourth and 15, I think that's one of the most interesting things. Um, and I think that's one of the most exciting things because it actually gives the team a chance to come back. Um, and I think those kind of things should be um, made more accessible. When you look at, like, the NBA, one of my favorite things about basketball is that, you know, you could be down 15 in, in the last quarter 
Um, and it feels like this insurmountable lead, but you get a roll of the ball, and all of a sudden you get some momentum going, you're back in the game. Um, and I think the NFL needs more of that. Too many times, you know, when a team's down 17 in the fourth quarter, it, it would basically take a miracle to win that game, the way the clock's managed and the way teams are so efficient with it. So, yeah, I think that's probably what I'm looking forward to most. Um, the next question comes from Mr. Pickleberry, who says, hey, Quincy, love your videos. Here's my question. Um, do you think, having two years of a head coach and offensive coordinator getting along if the things said about Monken are true had an impact on Baker's second year yes and two and half our head coach probably didn't help okay so yes um the whole Monken Freddie Kitchens thing just think about this in basic terms right you have the guy who was calling the plays for the offense and made your odds with the dude who was running the offense. That is a recipe for disaster. And it certainly affected Baker's second year. Um, and I think, you know, having more clarity and having an actual direction of the team um, is going to be so helpful to Baker Mayfield, especially if they're going to try to do some of this more, you know, play action boot, um, Kyle Shanahan kind of like new era West Coast style offense. Um, I think Baker Mayfield, will be fantastic at that. I think that is a perfect fit for Baker Mayfield. So hopefully this year is going to be better for him. I anticipate it is. Um, and yeah, certainly the Monken experiment with Freddie Kitchens, it was never going to work. Um, and it never did work. It, they were too too opposite and too stubborn. They weren't going to work with each other. Um, and they ultimately both had the collaborative job. You know, So yeah, that, that's pretty much what that situation was. And I do think it had an effect on Baker Mayfield. Hopefully it didn't affect him enough to where he has been damaged irreversibly as a quarterback, but I don't think that's the case. But thank you guys for asking all the questions. And if you want to ask questions, um, again, Make sure you have your notifications on, ding that bell, and hit that subscribe button so you can see when I post here on a community page to ask for questions. And also, you can ask for questions on Twitter, so follow me there at Quen C. The link is in the description for you to follow me on Twitter. There's a lot of people there. We have a good time on Twitter. Um, so check me out there if you want to make sure your question hits the show. But thank you guys for watching. Have a great day. If you want to, if you want to help, your view is good enough. But if you want to help just a little bit more, think about joining the Patreon. Buck a month helps keep the lights on. It helps keep this content coming to you. Um, so, again, thank you for watching. Have a great day. Have a good night.